it's such an incredible privilege and honor to have the opportunity to come before this incredible group of men, like like truly an exceptional uh, tribe. That that I, it's just a privilege that I that we're all so lucky to be here, right? To be born in this day and age in the United States of America, and then we get to be in this room. And when you have enough, getting the opportunity to do what I'm doing right now, it's the only thing that gets you up in the morning. So so thank you. I really appreciate that. As as Matt said. I can be a somewhat intense person. Do I have your permission to be very intense with you this evening? Yes. Is that what you want? Yes. Okay. I appreciate that. And just remember, you gave me permission. In front of you, there's uh, some little uh, you know, one sheets uh, on your, your core values. If you want to you know, pass those around the table right now, now's the time for that. Matt talked about how we want to be, you know, 15% passive, 85% active. I want this to be a very fucking active exercise for you. A little bit about me. I've got uh, an incredible wife, a, a lioness that I've been married to for 13 years. Uh, four kids so far. Uh, do a little bit of real estate sales, a little bit of uh, own some real estate. Uh, I just throw this up there as a, you know, just a credibility check that I've had success in some areas of my life, and I think some of the reason for that is because of my core values and because I, I, I live those core values moment to moment of my life. I credit it with my success more than anything else. I fired up a little website there, blackswanteam.com slash values. Uh, you'll, you can go get my personal values, my corporate values, my marriage vow, the worksheet you've got here. We'll put up a recording of this presentation. Uh, I don't need your email address or anything. You're welcome to sign up on my mailing list if you want. We're launching a new private equity fund next week, uh, but just free, free for the tribe here, so, so feel free to check that out. This is a cargo cult. This is a crazy concept. In World War II, GIs were stationed in the South Pacific, and they would land on a boat, and they would clear an airstrip, and they'd put up antennas and satellite dishes, and all of a sudden, planes would come from the sky full of food and clothing and guns, everything that anyone could possibly want as though God himself bestowed it upon them. And the indigenous tribes, they wanted their own cargo. So... They cleared landing strips, and they built antennas and satellite dishes, and they uh, got sticks of bamboo, and they marched in formation, and they imitated everything that they saw the GIs do and wondered why the planes never showed up, why they didn't get the thing that this other group, this other person got. I mean, we're doing the same thing, right? Because they were missing where the true value was created. I am in the multifamily business. There's a few cargo cult syndications out there. It was a half a billion dollar foreclosure uh, a few weeks ago. Have you ever felt like you're living in a cargo cult in one aspect or another of your life? Does this, does this make sense to you? This is a powerful concept to understand. You can go see cargo cult ceremonies to this day. It's passed down through the tribes. They will still march in formation waiting for their cargo to come. They will go to their graves waiting for their cargo to come. Gentlemen, I would be failing you if I let you show up at an event like this and talk about core values and build a fucking cargo cult of values. You have to live this. You have to understand where the value really comes from and you have to sear it into your heart or it is useless. In fact, it's much worse than useless, isn't it? Because these people could be doing productive things with their lives if they weren't living a lie. I will not let you live a cargo cult of values. So we're not here to talk about values. We're here to abolish the cargo cult of value stock. We're here to declare your reason to survive. We're here to discover the things that drive you the most. And ultimately, we're here to help you have better sex. Two things drive men. That's survival and conquest and reproduction. I want to make sure I'm firing on both cylinders today. I promise you I will deliver on that commitment. Here is a, I, I, I made this a little bit classier than the testimonial I got from my, my last presentation with the, with the tribe here. But uh, hey, Nick, this is so-and-so. I just had to reach out to you to let you know that it worked. My wife and I connected on a whole new level, and then we had the best sex in the history of our marriage. Thank you. This is real. Please live this. Please show up for the next 45 minutes in an emotional sprint. Can I count on you to do that? 
let's get started. There are some things so true, so true that they are worth dying for. And I would posit that if a man has not yet found something worth dying for, he's not fit to, fit to live. It's Martin Luther King Jr. saying that, not myself. I was born in 1983. I'm 40 years old. I have the peculiar honor of being the least parented generation in the history of humanity. I was a latchkey kid, so I got fewer parenting hours than any generation of human ever born. What an interesting experiment to run. I got vastly, vastly less dad time than any generation before in the history of human beings. If you're in this room, there's a good chance you fall into that generation. We are a generation of men raised by women who have not yet found our reason to live because we don't yet know what's worth dying for. Write it down right now. Don't think about it. Feel it. What is worth dying for in your life? You need to declare it to yourself. Declare it to your soul. And when you get home, you need to declare it to your wife. Declare it to your kids. Declare it to your staff. What in life is worth dying for. This is something that usually occurs pretty easily to masculine power, which is, which is, is something that's, that's been maligned in my generation. Uh, to, you know, to, to my dismay, and, and we see it every day in our culture. We don't live in that culture, though, if we're in this room, do we? We're okay with believing that there's things worth dying for and that these are the things that make us fit to live, and we have to write them down, and we have to live them day to day. Conversely, we also have to find a reason to live. So if masculine energy gravitates towards something worth dying for, feminine power typically gravitates towards something worth living for, this can be a really tough thing for, for fellas to, to figure out. After retirement, lifespan for most men falls off precipitously. Once you don't have a reason to get up in the morning, you stop getting up in the morning. Write it down right now. What do you have worth living for? I am just as comically, tragically flawed as any other man in this room. And I'll tell you, when I joined GoBundant several years ago, my health was my, my, my worst pillar. It's the thing I needed to work on the most. I didn't realize it because I lived with a bunch of unhealthy people in my day-to-day -day life. And when I stepped in this room, I'm like, holy shit, I am the least, health person, the least healthy guy in this room. That's, that's not acceptable. We become the people we spend time with. That's exactly what happened to me. And I realized that health vitality, energy, power is something that I had to live for. It was a value that was missing. I'm going to show you my values at the end. You'll see health was at the end of the list. It's no coincidence that it was at the end of my list and it was the thing where I had the worst outcomes relative to this peer group. You live your values whether you realize it or not. And when you write them down and you live them day to day, you take ownership of the thing that drives you the most whether you realize it or not. So write it down right now. What do you have worth living for? I want to celebrate a success. If I was at you know, uh, the least healthy time of my life a few years ago when I joined GoBundance, uh, on the right is me uh, winning my first, what I call it, reindeer game. So Chris Benson, who's probably one of the most fit people in the tribe, which is a high standard. I was hanging out with him at the, uh, the Champions event last month talking about, you know, I'm in the gym five days a week with a personal trainer, you know, just did a 355 deadlift last week and, uh, you know, doing mobility. And he's like, yeah, what do you think you can do on like a Turkish getup? Which if you're not familiar with it is a really challenging mobility movement. You have to hold a, a heavy weight above your head and go from lying down all the way to standing up. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe like 75 pounds or something like that. And he's like, bullshit. I, I couldn't even do 75 pounds. Like it's impossible. And I'm like, whew, you know, like he's kind of challenging my integrity here. And like, I'm pretty sure I could, you know, my working weight's like, you know, 40, so I'm pretty sure I could do one rep, but I was like really scared. And so went back to the hotel and, and, and put up 75 pounds. Uh, he, he tapped out at 65, by the way. So I'm sure he could crush me in every other health metric out there. But I, I reprioritized my values, guys. I wrote it down. It's the top of the list. Without this, you can't have anything else. It's something you have to live for. And I love that this group prioritizes it so much. Write it down. What do you have to live for? I remember when my first child was born, and I somehow conned my way into a meeting with Brian Evans, who's one of the top estate planning attorneys in the country, and my wife and I sat down with him and uh, you know, made a few pleasantries, and then he kind of cut to the chase and he said, okay, I just want to let you know that, uh, that attorney-client privilege is in place, you can say anything you want, uh, it's, it, you know, nothing will leave this room, and I'm like, okay, sounds good, yeah, let, let's, let's go. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. Whatever you need to tell me, you, you can tell me. It's, it's a secret. I'll keep it safe. And you know, I look over at my wife. I'm like, do you, do you know what he's getting on about? Is there, is there something on my shirt or what's going on? And, and, and finally he says, well, you know, 
Usually, I only talk to people your age when they've gotten some news, a diagnosis maybe. Has that happened? I'm like, no, uh, we, we just had a baby and we want to think about, you know, what if something did happen to us, you know, car accident, plane crash, whatever, and, you know, the, the baby's taken care of. And he kind of leans back in his chair and he exhales and he says, man, I mean, like less than 1% of my clients, they ever talk to me until they are imminently dying. What a tragic paradigm for most people to live in. And then he asked us a powerful question. He said, what do you want the world to look like when you are no longer in it? We're all terminal, aren't we? It's just a matter of time. Do you want to put your ding in the universe? Do you want to pass on wealth or uh, spiritual grace to your children or to your children's children? Write it down right now. What do you want the world to look like when you are no longer in it? People in this tribe, they talk about exiting businesses. Guys, you're going to fucking exit this life. What's your multiple on that EBITDA? It matters a lot more than selling the business that you're toiling on so hard. You have failed yourself, you have failed your wife, you have failed your children if you have not yet written down what you want the world to look like when you are no longer in it. The, the families, the great families that have dynasties, they've written it down, they've written a book. If you go study the Carnegies and the Vanderbilts, they have written it down what they want the world to look like as a result of the fortune that they've created. But the good news is you don't have to have a fortune in order to make lasting change. What do you want the world to look like when you're longer in it? Don't overthink this, just write it down. I want my children to be comfortable, or maybe I want them to be uncomfortable. I want them to experience extreme adversity, I don't know. Maybe you want everyone in this sphere to be taken care of. Maybe you want to give all your money to a certain charity or something, but don't even think about money. What wisdom do you want passed down? Go record your eulogy. Go record a time capsule, a message that's shared if God forbid the plane goes down on the way away from this event. I promise you it can be a life-changing exercise to go record that video to your son or your daughter or your wife. What do you want the world to look like when you're longer in it? Write it down. Who here in this room considers himself a leader? Ra raise your hand. We got a few leaders in this room, don't we? What kind of leader are you? Maxwell's Five Levels of Leadership is a fascinating concept. Recommend you check it out. People might follow you because you hired them and you know that's their position on the org chart because uh, they give permission to lead. Uh, you know, I, I will follow you, I choose to follow you because you're really good at what you do. You're a top selling real estate salesperson and so other real estate salespersons want to follow you. You know, if you really start getting up that ladder, it's because you pour into people doing things like what I'm doing right now. You develop people and they think, man, I just like, feel better about myself and I grow and I, I just, I'm, I'm better when I'm around this person. But if you get to the top, if you are a level five leader, people follow you because of who you are and what you represent. Write it down right now. What do you represent? Jesus, Gandhi, Moses, Elon Musk. These are level five leaders. People follow them because of who they are and what they represent. When someone speaks your name, there should evoke a visceral reaction. When I say the name Osama bin Laden, you feel a certain way, don't you? He's a very successful level five leader. I didn't say you couldn't be an evil leader. When I say uh, Elon Musk, he is an imperfect leader, but he evokes an emotion, doesn't he? I, I, I remember I was watching this video of, uh, of Elon just kind of like watching, you know, walking the pad. Does someone mind doing a little role play with me? Someone want to stand up here? So just, uh, just, a, just a guy on the pad, like a janitor just walks up and he goes, we're going to make it. We're going to get off this planet. We're going to do it. That's a level five leader. Are people doing that to you? If not, it's because you have not yet declared who you are and what, what you represent. Write it down right now. Thank you. I appreciate it. What emotions are conjured forth when someone speaks your name? Write it down and it will come to pass. I had an opportunity to celebrate this crazy birthday party uh, that my wife threw for me and she put together a string of like 100 people recording like a 15 second clip of the impact that I've had on their lives. And over and over and over again, they said the word integrity. It's not really like on my values sheet uh, you know, in, in a prominent way, but apparently that's what I evoke. 
I don't, I haven't decided what I, I mean, obviously that's a good thing, right? It's better than evoking, you know, selfishness or something like that. It should be completely unsurprising to me though it is the same word that happens over and over again. I promise you, you are denying yourself the most powerful leadership tool you have at your disposal by not having a clear set of values that you live moment to moment in your life. To think about this a separate way that's maybe a little less abstract, because I love to make things concrete, when you start a new business, you know, we're all at different layers, levels in our business, we all have different numbers of employees, you typically start out uh, by an employee saying, you know, what, what do I do? You know, you, you, pr you probably tell them what to do for the first, you know, few days, weeks, months, and then maybe you stop telling them what to do, which is your failure as a leader, and eventually they start asking, what does the boss do? And then if you prove yourself a person of integrity, of some level of values, integrity is not a sophisticated concept. Integrity is, I do what I say I'm going to do. Are you a man of integrity? At some point, if you just demonstrate yourself to be a person of integrity, they say, what does the boss say? Because they know that if you say it, it becomes reality. You develop the superpower to manifest reality through other people. Incredible superpower. But eventually, if you are a level five leader, people start taking you out of the equation. They ask, what do we do? And finally, they ask, what is right? Go listen in on a few questions, or listen in on a few meetings and, and see what questions they ask. Are they nervously looking over you? Hey, uh, what, what did he tell us to do again? Or are they asking questions like, okay, what have we done in the past? And if you get to a point where you have like employees who have hired employees who have hired employees, that's when you really get to figure out what you are all about. Every organization is a direct reflection of the mindset and the values of its leader. I'm gonna say that a second time. Every organization, your family, your business, whatever organization you might be a part of, it is a direct reflection of the values and the mindset of the leader. So here's a simple diagnostic test you can do to figure out the culture of your organization. Let's talk about stories. Storytelling is a sense-making device. It's the most powerful way to communicate knowledge in, in, in the human consciousness. H humans, they, they naturally organize information into story. So I want you to write down what are the most important stories in your life. Write it down right now. If, if your sheet is a beautiful mind type situation when you get done, you've accomplished the mission. It need not be pretty, it need not be perfect. The more you write down, the better. What are the stories that define your life? What is your finest hour? What's the dark night of the soul and when did it come and how'd you get out? Write it down right now. It can be just a few words. When my kid broke his leg, when my mom died, when I went to Vermont at GoBundance, and XYZ happened. Write it down right now. Don is a ruthless marketer in addition to being a very spiritual wise person. He says that you are not successfully communicating with someone if you don't punch him in the gut. Do I have your permission to punch you in the gut right now? I'm not actually gonna punch you in the gut. I'm going to tell you what I hope is a very impactful story. Do I have your permission to punch you in the gut? I had the privilege to work for the Mayo Clinic. This is an organization of considerable values and culture. The founders died a century ago, and it lives on today. 100,000 employees redefining what medicine and healthcare is, the number one healthcare institution on this planet. It is a very values-driven organization. And again, there's a Venn diagram between your, your organization, your company you lead, and your personal values, your, your company values. There should probably be a pretty significant overlap between them, right? So you should be writing down whatever speaks to you, and you can figure out later exactly what facet of your life that applies to. The Mayo brothers had a similar belief, and they lived that organization, and they were level five leaders, and they transmitted that set of values to the next generation, next generation. The Kool-Aid runs thick. They have a lot of stories to tell and I'm gonna tell you a story right now. Your first day on the job, they have a changing of the guard. People retire, people who have served the organization for 50 years, for half a century, and they cry about how their body can't do it anymore. Their soul wants to continue to give, to serve, to love, to care, but their body just can't do it anymore. And Mayo actually has a building that they constructed, that they erected adjacent to the, the, the patient care facility, so you can go retire and die and stay in the place you love when your body can't do it anymore. It's called the Charter House. You think they have a vision in this organization, I think they do. And after you hear about these people who have served the organization for half a century, on your first day of the job, they tell you to go out and help people find their way. I had a, like a high level role in the organization, and, uh, and so I said, you know, is this like our best use of time? Like this seems like kind of entry level employee type stuff, like is there something else I should be doing? And they said, Nick, I'm gonna let you in a little secret. 
The Mayo Clinic is a center of hope for the world. People come here looking for the cure, and sometimes we have it. But all too often, we're a second or a third opinion, and we're their last stop. There's a lot of people here who are getting bad news today, and we're very good at it. We have palliative care consults and estate planning consults. We're very good at helping you metabolize the fact that this is it. Faith, hope, science. The only thing worse than learning that today is the day you're going to die is to not be able to find your way to the reception desk for that estate planning consult. How bad is it to be lost alone? There are people crying in the hall all the time. And so we want you to go out and to be lost together. How much better is it to be lost together than to be lost alone? That's, that's a state of true despair. At least when you're lost together, you've got a buddy. And we're all terminal, aren't we? That's all we are, is we're just lost together. So we want you to go out and we want you to go get lost with other people because that's all we do as an organization. That's your first day on the job. And you get some stories to tell that you carry with you through your 50-year career at that organization. And then one day, I found myself quite lost. 18 months ago, I was at a spiritual retreat in Mexico with my wife. And she went into labor, which was not good because this baby was not ready. And baby Isaiah was born in our hotel shower uh, in the second trimester. And we've had miscarriages before. She's been pregnant 10 times. We've got four very healthy kids. This is our first, second trimester miscarriage where you've got a, a baby. And my wife's covered in blood. Our hotel room's covered in blood. Somehow, when we called the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate, they told the locals and, like, the Mexican police showed up to figure out where the dead baby was. And I had to, like, sh show them the, the baby. And no one could decide what to do with the baby. Is it, is, is it you know, a, a corpse that has to be remanded to the United... We, we just wanted to get our baby home. That's all we wanted. And I remembered... I know people who are really good at being lost together. And I called, I called the maternity ward at the Mayo Clinic, and I said, please help me. I am really fucking lost. The most lost I've been in my entire life, and I just want to get my baby home. Will you please be lost with me? I'm begging you. And they talked to me for about 10 minutes, and I kind of heard some shuffling in the background. We answered some questions. We made sure my wife was okay, and they said, okay, okay, we made a few calls, and... Um, uh, the Mexican police have been told to stand down, and you need to go to this airport. And we, uh, we spoke to the regional vice president at United. He's going to meet you, and he's going to take you through like a back way to get through the Mexican TSA so they don't hold you up, and you're on these flights, and you're going to be home in 17 hours. And we need you to show up right here, and we're going to take care of your baby, and we will be lost together. I'm so sorry that this is happening to you. And we got there, and they uh, did and prints and footprints, and, uh, and, they, and they dressed him. I was carrying him around in fucking Tupperware, and uh, I said, here's my baby. I don't know what to do with it. Do you know I'm so lost? And they knew exactly what to do because they are in the habit of being lost together. I felt so loved, so accepted, so whole. They inspire 100,000 people to pick up the fucking phone and do whatever it takes to get lost together on a daily basis because they have stories. Stories like this, countless other stories I could tell. What are your stories? The things that define you, the things that make your values, they're probably not your finest hour. They're probably the dark night of the soul. When your wife's lying in a puddle of blood in a hotel in Mexico, who the fuck are you? Who the fuck are you? Are you going to step up? Are you going to take care of the people who need you the most? And what are the values that are going to carry you through in that moment? Write it down. And when you get home, you need to tell your wife, you need to tell your kids, you need to tell your staff. 
you don't necessarily need to throw them all in. Don't do it without permission. You might want to ask permission exactly as I asked permission from you just now. Do you think what I'm telling you is legit? Do you think this is the case? Do you think this is truth? I'm glad to hear that. Write it down right now. What's your story? What's your story that you need to tell? Let me tell you about the antithesis of this. So uh, in 2016, uh, I helped a, a startup go from 13 million in venture capital to 100 million in private equity sale. Uh, right before they sold the company, they terminated me and seized my stock options. The vision of that company was to generate profit and value for our shareholders and our employees. Somehow I was surprised that they generated value for their shareholders before their employees. I should not have been surprised. This is the example of anti-values. This is the power of the cargo cult of values. They wrote down exactly what their value, I mean, I helped draft that, that mission, vision, value statement for that company, and they did exactly what their values were. Uh, in my company, we had this beautiful uh, tragedy that, that we had the chance to preside over. We buy, a lot of, we buy a lot of challenging properties. There's one property, there's a unit, tenant had not paid rent in two years. Uh, we couldn't get into it before we bought it. And when we closed, we, we got into the unit, one was there, and it was just a, it was just a cornucopia of tragedy. Just drugs, you know, paraphernalia from prostitution, every sadness you could imagine. And my team had to go get PPE and get like a five gallon bucket to, to, to collect all of the drugs and paraphernalia. And we sat with her in her living room and said, we're really sorry that the previous property manager let this happen. This does not happen on our watch. This does not happen on our watch. Half of my wife's family has died of drug overdoses. There is zero judgment in my heart for what you are going through. We're happy to help you dial a phone, give you a ride. Here's a drug rehab clinic that we support, but we're not going to let this happen on our watch. We can't actually evict you, but we're gonna come back tomorrow and the next day and the next day. We're gonna have the same conversation with you until we help you find help. And it took three visits, three fucking visits to get her into help and she got into rehab and she's actually doing pretty well today. This is a story that my staff tell my staff. Do you think it's hard for us to do a trivial rent collections call? Do you think my team can summon the metal to say, hey, yeah, you should probably pay your rent when you're not paying rent? I think they can because these are the stories that drive our organization. What are the stories that prove your metal, that prove your family's metal, your company's metal? Write them down. These are the stories you need to memorialize. These are the stories you need to tell. In our morning meetings, we tell stories. Uh, 8 a.m., Monday morning, every week, we have an all-hands meeting. We go through our seven, seven corporate values. We do one value per week, and we ask people to tell stories about how they've lived into those values. So tell us a story about radicalized transparency is one of our corporate values, and we write down the stories. We write them down. It takes three minutes, and we have a beautiful tapestry of stories, and everyone in our company understands who we are, and what we represent. Not me, Nick Stagerberg, we black swan. This does not happen on our watch. We got really dark there for a minute. We're gonna bring it back. <clears throat> if you've ever felt depressed, if you've ever felt frustrated, stressed, I've got great news for you. Your values are the thing that will save you. When you, when you stub your toe, it hurts. Why does your body give you pain? And you want to, why does your body make you hurt to protect you? How does it protect you? It stops you from doing it. If something hurts you, you go, shoot, I better stop doing that anymore. What do antidepressants do? They numb that pain. They defeat that feedback loop that psychologically is inflicting pain on you. So you stop doing the thing. Aristotle said, happiness is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. Or said another way, when you live in a way that is consistent with your values, you are happy, and when you're not, you're sad. So that's why I want you to write your values down right now. Because if you are upset about something, if you are sad, if you are depressed, it's because you are living a life out of alignment with your virtues. Unfortunately, that doesn't fit into a pill bottle very well, so it's not a well-known truth of our day. It was a very well-known truth a couple thousand years ago. What brings pain to your soul? Write it down. This is probably going to give you a good hint about where there's a gap in what you're doing and what you believe. We are not human doings. We are human beings, are we not? So who are you? Declare on that sheet of paper right now your beingness. This list of values is who you are as a human being. 
And I'll go one step better. If you're still feeling depressed, even though you feel a little out of alignment with, uh, or if, even though you feel like you're in alignment with your values, all you need to do, all you need to do ever is to just focus on gratitude. My, uh, the, the, the women who raised my wife that, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the, the couple that raised my wife who are essentially their parents, they had a great, uh, a great impact on our life. We, 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 gave them a house this past year. And every day, well, not every day, at least once a week, they'll message us about something they don't like about the house. It's the craziest thing. But they've just lived in scarcity for so long that that's all they can focus on. They think there must be a catch, that there's no way someone would just give them a house. It's so abundant. It's so generous. It defies understanding. And at first it was funny, and then it was, then we were angry, and then we were just sad. And sometimes I wonder if that's how it is with God or the universe or whatever you believe in. When you pray or meditate, are you focused on the things you're grateful for? Or are you focused on the, on the shortcomings there? Just think about the things you're grateful for. I was hanging out with uh, Jerry Clayman day before yesterday, and he said every day when he gets home from work, he looks at his house and his family, and he says to himself out loud, you got to be fucking kidding me. This is my life. I get this. This is absolutely incredible. What are you grateful for? You probably know what your competitive edge is in business. There's a good chance this is your values. Write it down right now. What is your competitive edge that puts you ahead of the competition? If you are good at it, if you work hard, if you provide a better level of customer service, this is probably your values. It's a great hint. What's your competitive edge for us? Our slide deck dry, or is driven by our values. So we actually write down our values, and then we, write, we, we, we compose our slide deck with that as the core. I had the great privilege to go to West Point with uh, GoBundance last November, or November before last. And I thought they were going to teach us like combat stuff or whatever. And they said, well, we can't teach you that here. All we can teach is integrity and values. Because war is boxing. You get into a ring and you punch each other into the face until someone gives up. And values are the thing, that, the competitive advantage that will let you stay in the ring longer. You don't need to win. No one ever wins at war. You just have to let the other guy tap out. That's all they can do. They, they are a learning organization. At least once per 30 minutes, someone would say, we are a learning organization. Anytime I said something, that's like their, their bonus time right there. And finally, they said, what's the most important piece of the puzzle when you're putting a, a puzzle together? Any, anyone want to say? The box top. That's exactly right. It's not the corner pieces. It's not the edge. It's the box top. What's your box top? Every moment of your life, you are projecting a vivid vision of what the end product is supposed to look like. What are you projecting? Are you hiding the box top? You ever put together a puzzle with one of those assholes where, hey, no, I need to see where this piece goes, but, you're, but you have it all to yourself. Raise your hand if you have your values prominently displayed in a place in your home. Your homework, one of your many homework assignments is going to be to take this sheet of paper home and just put it up on your fridge. It will change your life in a way you, 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 it will surprise you in how it changes your life. Uh, here are some of our corporate values. You can go grab that from our website if you want. I don't need your email. Here's our family values. Uh, steal them if you want, but don't become a cargo called values. These need to be the things that you own. I love the inspiration I get from other GoBros when I do these things, but these need to be things that you own. Here's our wedding vow. That's also on the website. When's the last time you proposed to your wife? It will delight her. Go, go propose to her as soon as you get home. I promise you, you will thank yourself for it shortly thereafter. And if you use the out-of-the-box wedding vows, maybe you should write some up. Maybe you should do a little you know, uh, overnight retreat with her and draft up some wedding vows. So we were on stage a few months ago at our last conference, uh, and, and I, just, I had the clicker, and I just decided to propose to her. We will follow each other into folly, into fire, into the future, into forever. I hope this makes her blood boil for me. You have to declare your reason to be married to your wife continuously, which brings us to our grand finale. I promise you better sex, and gentlemen, I will deliver, per that testimonial. So I've got this like three foot by five foot lion print above the bed uh, in our home because it is my standard that we fuck like lions. If there are not claw marks on my back, we have not achieved the mission. Can I get an amen? amen. You have high standards in your life if you're in this room. Do you have high standards in your romantic life? I promise you that your wife will appreciate high standards. Give it a try if you don't believe me. We're talking about values here today because there is nothing more attractive, more desirable than a man on a mission who knows exactly where he's going and what he's all about. We as cavemen were built to die for our family. That's why we're here on this earth. And if you've not told your wife lately that you will die for her, you are shortchanging her because cave woman was put on this earth to attract 
and retain a caveman that's willing to die for her. Think about how unfair that relationship is for just a moment. They get pregnant, they have a baby, they're so vulnerable, and they have to find someone willing to die for them to protect them from that tiger. Have a little empathy for the unfairness, the inherent unfairness in how we were built. Have a little empathy for that situation and give her exactly what she, what she needs in the most powerful way possible. Here's an example. This is not an abstract concept. So if it was my, you want to you do another role play? It's going to be a little weird. Right. <laughs> I, I'm a high intensity person, so you, you make this your own. But this is what I will tell my wife when I get home. I'll look deep into her eyes and I'll tell you, I love you. I own you. I will always provide for you. I will die for you. I love you. I own you. I will always provide for you. I will die for you. Do you understand me? Yes, I do. Thank you. That's all I need to know. Appreciate it. You ever been at a restaurant and your wife's like, ah, the food's kind of cold. I don't like it. You know, can you like send it back or something? You ever feel like you're being tested? You think, yeah, she's kind of crazy. How crazy is it? the unfair situation they're put in. How will you know if caveman will die for you? You have, to, you have to test. You have to test when it doesn't matter. So when my wife says the food's a little cold, I'm like, you let me at that fucking waiter. Where are they? We want hot food right here. She has to know I will leap to my feet and I will die with a smile on my face for her. And if she feels that in the core of her soul, she will give herself to me in any way I want, anytime I want, because that is why she was put on this earth. Can you make your wife feel that way? You are cheating her if you don't. You are denying her the thing that she needs most. Please do that. And if you're still not sure what your values are, ask yourself, what makes your wife proud? What makes her ashamed of you? Because somewhere deep in the core of your soul, she is guiding you to the path of righteousness. Feminine power is much wiser than masculine power. Masculine power is very good at dying for its family, is not very good at figuring out which target to go after. <laughs> so ask yourself, maybe even ask her, what makes you proud of me? What makes you ashamed of me? You might be surprised and you might discover the thing that sets you on fire, the thing that sets her on fire. So I've got a few homework items for you. When you go home, you need to make sure your wife understands in her heart, in her soul, that you would die for her with a smile on your face. Can I trust you to do that? Yes. You're going to email a copy of this to yourself. You're going to set a calendar reminder to go over this with your wife. It'll be a powerful, life-changing experience if you lean into it, if you sear it into your heart and soul. I appreciate the opportunity to be intense with you. It's a sprint. We don't have to be like this all the time, but just a moment of intensity can change your life. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you.